Hi, my name is Ron Martino. I am a programmer and an engineer. I've been working with electronics for around 30 years. Recently, I saw this video on YouTube that was called Hacker Interview Gummo. And I said to myself, hey, I can probably relate to that because I was studying in the US in 1992 and 1993. I took AP Computer Science and I'd be familiar with most of the stuff he would be talking about. Okay, so I started watching this video and I had several thoughts that I would like to share with you today. So here goes. My name is Gummo. I am a hacker. Okay, imagine a policeman being interviewed like a very accomplished policeman who saved a lot of lives, put a lot of criminals to jail, and he says, Hi, my name is John Smith, and I am a superhero. That would be weird, right? So, a hacker in the world of computers and programming and IT is sort of elite. A hacker is someone who has ultimate knowledge of basically everything. Programming, electronics, reverse engineering, networking, assembly language. So for someone who works with computers, it would make sense to say, I'm a computer security expert, or I do reverse engineering. Or one could simply say, I am a programmer. I think it's a really weird thing to say, I'm a hacker, because hacker is not a profession. In my opinion, you really have to think a lot of yourself and your skills to call yourself a hacker. I started a bulletin board on a local BBS system and started to meet other hackers online. Well, in the first place, BBS stands for bulletin board system. So what he's actually saying is, I set up a bulletin board on a local bulletin board system system. It doesn't make sense. He also saying he started meeting other hackers online. A bulletin board system is a kind of a simplistic file server that anyone can access with the help of the modem. By calling BBSs, he could only meet people that were users of the same BBS, and they were basically like 20 to 50 people usually. Conferencing, however, was possible at that time. There was what? Usernet, and there was also FidoNet. And you could actually meet people there from several places, from several countries. But he never mentioned that. So if he really were part of that community, he should have mentioned FidoNet and Usernet, not BBSs. I'm learning how to code myself. I've set up a bulletin board. I'm living with the friends of the family. And they are barely able to support me. Much barely themselves as well. Well, well okay, he's saying that he was hardly making his living. That he was nearly broke. How could he afford to run a BBS then? He says, I've set up a bulletin board. Running a bulletin board means that you need to have a dedicated computer running 24-7 and a separate phone line to accept incoming calls. Who paid for that? A decent 486 cost at least $1,500 at that time and a 14.4K modem around $200. But he was staying, like he says, with friends of the family who could barely support themselves. Did they pay for a separate phone line? Did they buy a computer for him and a modem? Like he says, acoustic modem. What's an acoustic modem? We never used that term at that time. I actually googled acoustic modem and turns out there is such a thing, but it's a device used to transfer data underwater. This is a term totally out of the blue. That doesn't make sense either. Back in those days when you needed gas for your car, there was a dial on the gas pump and you would flip the dial on and off. If you took an old-fashioned speaker magnet and set it next to the handle, that would flip it up and engage the pump. Well, actually, <laughs> that's not how it worked. I just googled and found information online. There was a relay close to that handle, inside the pump case. If you held a magnet close to it, the relay would engage and power the pump. For someone who actually hacked smart cards to say that a magnet actually flipped up a handle, that's absurd that's impossible like does the guy know what a relay is i had a 1982 chevrolet chevette and all of my stuff was there including my trs 80 model 2 and i lived in my car i have never heard about trs 80 model 2 you know why because the thing is way too old it was around in like 1979 i just googled that computer and it was based on the xilog z80 
I know Xilinx Z80 perfectly because my childhood computer, Speccy 48K, was based on that processor. I really programmed it a lot. I still remember the assembly language of Z80, but that is a very, very old processor. It can address 64 kilobytes of memory only, and it's 8-bit. What did he do with that computer? Is he trying to tell us he ran BBS software on it, or even used it to log on to BBSs? So I was in the US in 1992, and the computer that everyone used at that time was Apple Macintosh. Some people still had an older model, Apple IIe, that I'm also perfectly familiar with, and I coded it in assembly. And the people who were into the BBS business, we all had PCs, IBM PC. Software that was distributed on the BBSs was written for the Intel platform, the 8086. That TRS-80, Z80-based, what did he even use it for? I have no idea. So there I am, bagging groceries, teaching myself C, COBOL, FORTRAN, all of the old languages. Why would he learn COBOL and FORTRAN? Those languages were way outdated even at that time. Uh, so I took AP Computer Science and we coded in Pascal and C at that time. No one used those languages. And like hacking is mostly low level programming. You have to code in assembly language and also in machine code. You have to remember some opcodes, operation codes for different processors because sometimes you have to edit hex data. You don't need Fortran for that. There is no place for Fortran and COBOL in that. He taught me about smart cards, the little chip cards that everyone carries around. Actually, the cards that people carried around, banking cards, credit cards, debit cards, they never used a chip at that time. Visa and MasterCard, you can look it up, introduced chip-based cards in 2012. Well, he obviously means banking cards, confusing them with some other type of cards. We were able to reverse engineer about five different providers who issued chip cards for their services. We successfully decrypted those services. Now, he's talking about hacking satellite TV systems. Okay, in the first place, you don't reverse engineer a provider. If you have a device that is functioning and you need to either clone this device or find out some specific information about how it's functioning, then you have to draw the schematic and you have to extract the firmware to disassemble it so you can look at the source code. That's what reverse engineering is. When we say reverse engineer, we always mean a physical device. You reverse engineer a device. He says we reverse engineered providers. You don't say that. It doesn't make sense. We decrypted those services. Here is how satellite TV worked at that time. You had to purchase a satellite receiver that was a device that would sit on your television and you had to pay for subscription and the subscription was coded in the smart card that you inserted in that device. So what he's actually referring to here is coming up with software and also hardware to modify card contents and behavior that would allow to continue using the satellite receiver after the subscription had expired. So the correct way to describe what he and his dude had allegedly done would be we reverse engineered the smart card, figured out the way decryption worked, and came up with a way to reprogram the card to allow free access to services. The work they had allegedly done does not involve decrypting anything. It's the satellite box that does decrypting. Actually, building a chip programmer device is a big deal. You gotta have a degree in engineering to do that. But he never mentions any of that. He said, we decrypted services. I decided to sell my wares for programming DirecTV satellite access cards. Now, wares, I think he means wares with a Z? Okay, wares is the name for software that was once legitimate, but then was pirated and distributed online for free, like Microsoft Windows, Adobe Photoshop, Cubase, the musical arrangement program. People crack them and distribute them online for free. Well, that's wares. He's mentioning a piece of code that he wrote to work with those smart cards. He says reprogram them. Okay, uh, that's not called wares. That has no relation to <laughs> wares. It's just a piece of code. Wares. Weird. We made $10 million each and I was able to get what I wanted. Tell me something. If you're American, uh, is it possible to spend $10 million in America without filing a tax report? Like... How could he spend that money? Wouldn't IRS be on his trail? 
as far as I know, that's not possible in the United States. Well, maybe it's possible in some other countries, but in the USA, they'll track you down and put you to jail. How did he spend that money? I built a supercomputer that was able to mine Bitcoin, mined about 5,000 Bitcoin. At that point, I believe Bitcoin was trading at 200 to 300 a coin. Like every IT person, I naturally did mine. And like 99% of miners, I didn't make Why? Because most people sold whatever they mined immediately. And if you ask me if it was profitable, well, I was hardly making twice the electric bill maybe. And on the whole, it was not worth it. What you actually have to do with crypto and mining is hold it. Like they say in the crypto community, huddle. You can Google the huddle thing. If you actually do hold, there's a good chance that you can make millions, but you have to make it at the right time. But that's not the point. There were basically like three stages of Bitcoin mining. Stage one was when you could mine Bitcoin using a regular computer. There was a piece of software that you just downloaded off the net, installed on your computer, Windows or Linux or whatever. You had to enter Bitcoin address, wallet address. You started the program and it would mine for you. And in mining, Whoever has more computing power can mine more coins. Like if computer B two times faster than computer A, mining with computer B, you will make two times more bitcoins during the same period of time. So naturally, people wanted to mine faster. So mining, that's stage two, moved from computers to GPUs, video cards, because it turned out that video cards had processors that could mine much faster. Not that they were actually faster, but they were specialized for graphics and that features could be utilized for mining. So people started stuffing like six to 10 video cards on a single motherboard. That wasn't an easy task. And those mining computers, they generated a lot of heat, noise, etc. And then at some point, someone came up with an idea of using specialized processors for mining. So mining migrated from GPUs to what they're called now, ASICs. An ASIC is a specialized processor and there are like 5 or 10 or 20 processors on the single board. And there are several boards in that device. And a typical Bitcoin miner computer looks like this. Mining data center looks like this. Okay, now back to our Mr. Hacker. He says, I built a supercomputer. Now, what the hell is a mining supercomputer? There ain't such damn thing as a mining supercomputer. If you have a million dollars, like he said, there was that person who was willing to invest a million dollars in mining. What you do is you rent a big data center and you put, say, a thousand mining computers in there. Well, that's a lot of electrical power too. If it's a thousand computers, probably you'd need around maybe 15 people because the mining computers, they always cause troubles. They always overheat, fans stopping, power supply units failing stuff like that. You have to clean them all the time. And also they can be a fire hazard. So you really need to have fire alarm there. But he solved all those problems by building a supercomputer. Right. I'm really good at hunting hackers and finding people. How do you hunt down a hacker? Hackers are usually hiding behind VPN. These days this term is often misused. So what hackers usually do to hide their personality and hide their real IP address, they use a series of VPNs that connect to each other. If you ask me, can the police track that down? Well, hypothetically, yes. But usually they use countries that are not really willing to cooperate, like China, Russia, etc. So how do you really hunt a hacker? There isn't such thing as hunting hackers. Like if you read the stories of hackers that were actually arrested, how it really happened is there was some undercover agent who was posing himself as a hacker and he would be part of those hacker groups five to ten years and they trusted him and then just at some point he turned all them in. This is how it actually was done. He says, I'm good at hunting hackers. Do -do 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 -do. Hacker buster. Celebrities and stars. I work with them personally to solve any cybersecurity questions or issues that they have. Okay, if you're a celebrity or a star, or even if you aren't, there is one single good advice that I can give you. If you're up to taking nude pictures of yourself or your partner, don't ever do it with a device that has internet on it. Like, if you enjoy that, here is what you gotta use. A regular camera. Regular cameras sometimes have Wi-Fi access, but it's very limited and it's very primitive. There's no way a hacker could get into that regular camera. 
but for smartphones and tablets it's really different. Most applications that you install have access to your photo storage. If any of those applications is malicious, they can steal your photos. They can also steal them instantly the moment you take them. If you took a nude picture and deleted it in five minutes, it could already be on its way to someone's server. So just don't ever do that. A lot of people realize, and a lot of banks will deny this. But banks actually have back doors to your accounts, into your system. I think he meant a lot of people don't realize, and he said a lot of people realize, but okay, that doesn't matter. Now, this is the most confusing part. Banks have back doors into your accounts. Okay, what's a bank? A bank is an organization that's there to administer your accounts. Am I wrong here? So, banks actually do have back doors, front doors, side doors, and all type of doors to your accounts. They use those doors to do wire transfers, to send and receive payment, and whatever stuff any bank is supposed to do. I just have no idea what he actually meant by that backdoor. What's a backdoor in programming? Uh, consider this example. Many smartphones have those unlock pattern that you have to draw on your screen to unlock the screen. Imagine that is just a hypothetical situation, not an actual operating system. Imagine that the person who wrote that piece of code is malicious. So what he did is hard coded a certain pattern that would work on all phones. So when you use your phone, you set up a new pattern, right? And you think that's the only pattern that unlocks your phone. But in reality, there would be two patterns that would be unlocking it, your pattern and the one the hacker hard-coded into it. So that's basically what a backdoor is. Again, he said, banks have backdoors into your accounts. Well, he probably meant that applications that you use to access the banking system that you install on your computer, on your smartphone, those applications they have access to your system, to your files, photos, messages, etc. Well, that's sort of true, but that has nothing to do with backdoors to accounts. But whatever he meant, the terminology he used was so wrong that it's very hard to understand what he actually meant when he said that sentence. Websites have so many flaws in them, whether it's a web server running an open port or a misconfigured file on your server. There's this thing called server. A server is a hardware device, a computer that is mounted in a rack stand and placed in a data center. A web server is a piece of software that's running on the hardware thing. And these are, although they're both called servers, are completely different things. Now, a web server is a software that serves web pages. And basically, it has only two ports open port 80 for HTTP and port 443 for HTTPS. And in programming, they are called listening sockets. A web server cannot function without those ports being open. If they were not open, it would not be able to serve web pages to you. When I read this, I realized that he actually meant server as a hardware device, not the web server. In a hardware device, it actually is possible to have some random open ports if the administrator is not very professional. They can overlook things and have some software installed by mistake along with the operating system and it would be running and have open ports that could pose a vulnerability to the system that a hacker could possibly use. But that's not possible with a web server. Also, there isn't such thing as running a port. He said, web server running an open port. You don't run a port, you run software. Ports can be open. You can have open ports, like I said, listening sockets. You don't run them. No programmer who studied computer science would ever say running a port. I have my jump bag with Bitcoin collection. Well, that reminds me of an old joke. Like a guy is coming to a doctor and says, uh, Doc, I have problems with my friends and relatives. And he says, so what is the problem? And he says, well, uh, the problem is that I really like salami. And the doctor says, so what's the problem? I also like salami. And the guy's like, really? Would you like to come over to my place and see my collection? What the hell is a Bitcoin collection? How do you keep it in your bag? Bitcoin is digital money. Crypto, rather. Coins. We don't call crypto money but it's sort of money, but it's purely virtual. 
To get access to your Bitcoin, all you have to know is the private code that translates to a Bitcoin address. There's tons of videos on that. I wonder if Mr. Hacker ever used or touched Bitcoin. Bitcoin collection. How did he even come up with this sentence? And one more thing. This guy poses himself as a cybersecurity consultant, but he's carrying his Bitcoin allegedly worth around $7 billion in his bag. And he talks about that on YouTube. I tell you, carrying all your Bitcoins in a bag with you and informing the entire world where you actually keep them is a hell of a bad cybersecurity advice. Please understand that in no way I ever meant to sound disrespectful to the people who made this video. Well, maybe it's a nice bedtime story to hear. You decide for yourself. That was Ron Martino, and I'd really love to hear what you think. Please give me a thumbs up and subscribe. I'll see you later. Be good.